Nick, I just bought a bunch of meat from the store. Now it is gray, but it was very cheap. Do you think that's a good value? I think it sounds like a great value. Don't eat gray meat, y'all. Don't you do know, it. We're the only people who are brave enough to say it. Don't eat gray meat. Don't meats. do it. All What's right? up, everybody? My name is Nick. I'm Mike. We're the Brothers Murph. Today we're talking about games that we think are a great value. Now, I want to say, I think all board games are a great value. Because you know Boom. why, Mikey? Board what? games don't go bad. They don't. Like, they, they can just sit in your closet for 20 years. Unlike me, And you can just bought. come back to it. Yeah, it'll just be dusty, if anything. But it'll just sit there forever. They actually hold up really yes. well. Especially because board gamers are discerning folks. You can folks. pass them on. They typically take extra <laughs> good care of stuff. They do. Uh, so, yeah, they're all a good, a good value. Yeah, but I, we're going to talk about ones that are even, per, even still are... I particularly think, great value. Exactly, exactly. So, a quick little caveat. We're not going to talk about, like, chess. A, a deck of cards. Those are the best value board games of course. ever because you can play a billion games on it. So now that's, we're, we're talking about just proper kind of board game board games, not like just like abstract games like that. Right. So let's go ahead and get into it. Before we start, over on our Patreon, we have 10 more games that we think are an exceptionally good value. So make sure to check out our Patreon. There's lots of cool stuff over support there. Today. First thoughts, supplemental top tens, a whole bunch of cool stuff. So make sure to support today. If you want to, we'd really appreciate it. Secret. Okay, so we talked to our people at Google. Now, normally, when you want to subscribe to a channel, you be like on YouTube. Usually, it's like it's like it's like five. It's it's like it's like twenty bucks usually. But we talked to our people at Google. We're like Google, just for this video. How about we make it free? And they're like, boys, we got you. And we said thank you, Daddy, which they do require us to call them, which we don't like. It's weird, but it's we do weird, it. But we do it anyway. So for this video alone, subscribing is free. It's a great value. Click that subscribe button if you haven't already. It's the only day it's going to be free. Tell your friends. It might already be not free. So make sure to click it quick, please. All right, for real, number ten is all party games. Yes. That's kind of a cop out, I know. But yeah, we're 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 already off the rails yeah. on this list. But really, party games are they're in like places like Target, Walmart, things like that. They're and they're price to sell. Because they are meant for the mass market. But like yeah. party games, our favorite one right now is probably Green Team Wins. Games like this are an insanely good value because you can play them with everyone. They're meant to be played kind of with the family, with yeah. anyone and everyone. And they're just really, really fun. They're easy to get into. You can play with a large group typically. So Generally. if you want to talk about value, it's like, okay, well, if we're all playing this game, there's 12 people and it costs $15, you're only paying a dollar, you know, whatever per yeah. person per play for the first play and then it's basically free. It yeah. sells itself. Uh, it, they, it's hard to beat. I mean, yeah. again, they're always easy to get into, accommodate large groups. They're fun. They're silly. They create memorable moments. Yeah. Green Team Wins is really great because it's all about kind of getting in the mind of your opponents and you want to be part of the popular answer. Yeah. If there's a an answer everyone is saying honey mustard because they're sociopaths, <laughs> you want to say honey mustard because you want the points and stuff yeah. and you're trying to stay on the green team. And yeah. that's just really fun because... Honey Mustard is a specific reference to a game we played of this, and there's still discussion going on from that one play. Yeah. And that is amazing. Because it's like for you know, 15, 20 bucks or whatever it is. I mean, yeah, it's, it's really... the best. Because Green Team Wins is basically a game where you're going to have prompts. So the prompt yeah. will be like blank mustard, and then everyone has to fill in what they think it is. Whatever they think the most popular yes, answer is going to exactly, be. Yes, exactly. Even if they don't agree. You are on the Green Team if you're with the most popular answer, and that's how you score points is being on the Green Team. Yep. So we, of course, put yellow mustard, the best mustard. Because literally all mustard is yellow. Yeah, and everyone else is like honey in mustard, the yellow scheme. Like a bunch of sociopaths. And so... Uh, it comes up, but it's just, it, you create these memories and these, especially like word association games. Yeah. You can do it so, so well, just one, so clover. A lot of these, there's like, there's so many of these party games that again, like tend to be cheap because they're meant for the mass market and they're just so fun. You can play them for years and years and years and years and years and years and years. You'll never, ever stop. And they're just great. They're just absolutely great. So really all party games, number 10. Pick now we'll get into the, the, the more specific ones. Number nine is going to be a really great abstract strategy game that tends to be quite cheap, and this is Santorini. Yes. Santorini also got great production value for like, it tends to be like 25 bucks or maybe even less if you catch it on a really good sale. But this is kind of like a chess-like game on this like big 3D board, and basically you're building out kind of the, the stereotypical buildings you see in Santorini. Yeah, it's like the, the big the white, white buildings. buildings with like the blue domes. It's I've been to Santorini. It looks like that. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And basically, you have your little workers, and on your turn, it's very, very simple. You can, you will move one of your workers, and then that worker will build in one of the eight spaces around it because it's on a grid. Yep. And you basically, when you move, you can move 
up a level if you're next to a building. If you're on the first level, you can move to the second level if there's a second level next to you. Your goal is to try to get to a third level. Yes. But what someone can do is they can pop a dome on a third level and kind of block you. Yeah, complete a building and stuff. So you're trying to build and you're, again, you always move, you always build on a turn. And yeah. you're sort of trying to build in a situation where you can A, be able to physically move up the yes. levels, but then also create a situation where it's like, now there's two possible ways I can yeah. win. So you can't stop them both because you can only do one build exactly. per turn. There's also a bunch of god powers you yes. can introduce. That's just the base game is doing that. And that is enough right there. It's great. But there's these god powers where you basically get some sort of rule you can break or a thing that you can do that not is not normally the case for yeah. other people. Maybe it helps you, the way you build or move. Uh, the amount of levels you can ascend on a turn, and that gives a ton of variety. A ton, because there's a bunch of different god cards, and they all work. Like one of them is like I can't remember who it is, but like they can put a dome on any building, on the, including any level. on the ground. So you can just like dome, dome. You're just like dome and everything, and you can do all these kind of crazy things. But the the base game is so insanely simple, and then the god powers make it a little bit more complex, but not like a lot more complex. It's still, I would say, less complex than something like chess. Sure. And then it's just. And then it's just tactical strategy. You're trying to maneuver. But again, the, the buildings are these like lovely like 3D plastic buildings. Yep. It's up on this like elevated board. It's got gr these little miniatures, your little builders. It's super good. And the, again, usually it's like 25 bucks, maybe cheaper, maybe 30, depending on where you are. But it's just like, it's a really, really good price for a game that you can play over and over and yeah. over and over again. And really again. like invest in and practice and get better at. Kind yeah. of like a lot of good abstract yeah, games. Yeah, exactly. You can be rewarded by the more you play. It's just really, really good. And it's got a banger price, banger look. It's just a blast. And Santorini is awesome. It's our number nine. Number eight is a game called Kinfire Dell. Yeah, there's now, a couple of these is, now. Yeah. yeah, there's a couple of them now. And uh, they are based on or set in the same world as the Kinfire Chronicles, which is a bigger campaign a game. A huge game. Cooperative yeah. campaign game where you're unlocking different elements and stuff. And Kinfire Delve is like a little micro cosm of the larger game where you are going to play uh, different characters from the main game and you're delving down uh, to the bottom of a stack of cards ultimately yeah. to then face down the, the kind of well master, the, the kind of big the bad big boss, yeah. at the end. So it kind of takes a lot of the experience of Kinfire Chronicles, the way the card play works, the way you can boost each other's attacks by playing cards. When it's your turn, I can play certain cards just to help up the, uh, the challenge, you know, the progress you're making on the challenge that you're yeah. going for. And it kind of works all those um, elements and stuff into what is ultimately like a 45 minute game now. So it's much yeah, easier to get to the like, table. If and that. it's like 20 bucks. It's, it's, like, like, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. They're $19.99, which again is crazy because the first game they came out was Kimfire Chronicles, which is like a $150 game. It's sure. It's a massive humongous. campaign game. Massive game. I mean, you can play for hours and hours and That's hours. That's a good value in itself, too. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, those <laughs> kind of campaign games we would argue and we will argue probably a little bit later yeah, are a very good value. Um, but this one, again, it's like a $20 game and you're delving down. But a big part of it, as Mikey said, is like you're doing what's called delving. So a lot of times whenever you defeat these enemies, there's always going to be like four cards out that you're kind of like trying to defeat. They're different, yeah, challenges. Oftentimes they'll allow you to delve, which means you get to go through the deck. And essentially you're going through the deck, diving deeper, trying to get to the bottom. And the cool thing is when you delve, all the cards you're delving through, you just put in the discard pile. Mm -hmm. So like we've played this game a bunch of times and we're still finding cards that we've just never come across. Because sometimes you're like delving for like five, which means you're then getting rid of the card you just defeated and five more random other cards are on top of the deck. And so it's always going to be different because the deck can be constructed in different ways. There are different kind of like end bosses in each one. There's like four in the, yeah, in the version that we have. And again, they're coming out with more of these. But again, it's like, it's 20 bucks and it's like super fun. It's cooperative. As Mike said, you could boost each other's um, turns. So I, I can play cards on Mike Mike's turn to help out. It's really, really fun and interesting for like a really great price. And again, it's in a small little package. It's a great price. And you can just play it over and over and over again because you're just delving. So it's always going to be different. Yeah, 100%. And you can combine the multiple sets to create like three and four player games yeah. and things like that if you want to up the player count or each individual set can be a solo or two player yeah. game. Yeah, there's just a lot of fun stuff. I think to your Every point. Every character is different too. Yeah, yeah it's Every like. Every character is different the way they work and then the whole fact that you're not going to see, no. I don't know, maybe even like a third of the you cards, like half the cards at half? max you'll see. Yeah. Uh, per play, and so it was kind of like a, a slow burn for yeah. revealing all of the stuff I think it's a stuff great you're deal value. Yeah. yeah, it's one that we've really enjoyed and stuff, and again, if you want a feeling of like a larger campaign game, it's set in that world of Kinfire Chronicles, but into a quicker, uh, smaller package. Um, there you go, I'm sheep to boot. So much of this, this whole list is gonna be about variety. One game that's got a ton of variety is the Quest for El Dorado. This is a really great racing game that again, tends to be around like the 35, 
maybe 40 bucks range, depending on where you're finding it and stuff. But this is a great game where you are trying to find El Dorado and you are racing to there and you have a map that's set up with these big kind of like hexagon tiles that have a whole bunch of different spaces on them. Bunch of land types. And there are, are whole bunch of different ways you could set up this. You could just like randomly set up however you want. There's like a bunch of suggested ways to set it up in the in the rule book. And uh, there are different land types. There's like jungles and like markets and water. And uh, you have to play like machete cards to essentially hack your way through the jungle. So yeah. to get through there, you have to play as machete cards. To get through the market, you have to pay money cards because you're like kind of paying your way through. To get across water, you have to put paddle cards. And so it's a deck building game where you're building your deck and then kind of trying to move your people through all these different landscapes to eventually get to El Dorado first. And on top of that, there's like all these other cards that you'll be adding to your desk, desk, deck. And then there is like a, a set of like kind of better cards you can kind of bring into yeah. the market. There's a market and the market's kind of variable in that there's all these different, there's three card sets of each of these. Yeah. Like if it's a, you know, uh, a certain card, there'll be three copies of it, and a market that's available. So you can only buy from the market that's available. Yeah. Once one of those little decks of cards runs out, meaning everyone's bought them, the next player then can purchase from the market and choose to bring in yeah. a new uh, type of card. Yeah. So from game to game, certain cards may or may not ever be available because yeah. no one ever brings them into the market. So that adds some variety there. Again, the setup and everything that you go to uh, changes and then changes the kind of way you have to plan your way through because there's oftentimes kind of shortcuts through maybe the, the thickest part of the yeah. jungle, but it might be like a three machete space. And so you need to have a card, a single card that has a three machete symbol on it yeah. to hack through that spot. So maybe you go for it, but you end up stuck trying to draw the right card at the yeah. right time, or do you take a more you know, a scenic route that's a little bit easier to navigate and stuff because if I have, if I have a three machete card and just three single machete spaces in front of me, yeah. I can move through all three <laughs> of those and kind of like do, use a spillover. Yeah. Uh, so it's just a lot of decision points to be made there, but there's expansion materials, there's ways you can kind of um, add stuff just even to the base game. Um, there's caves to explore and tiles. There's just really a lot of stuff. And yep. you're not going to use all of it in each no. game because no. of the way that the market and stuff presents itself. Yeah, and again, like the maps, I believe, are double-sided, so they're not yeah. they're not the same. And again, you can you can set them up really in a, t a very many different ways. You could possibly yeah, set this easy, game up. Make it hard. Make it super easy, make it super hard, make a short one, a long one. There's so many different ways, and that changes it so much. And then on top of that, deck building is just inherently replayable. We One thing that's not on the list, we could have chosen something like Star Realms or Hero Realms, because it's just like... Deck building games, because every game is different, because you don't know the order of th the cards are going to come out, what cards are going to be available, it always changes up the game. And then yeah. you add a racing element with really with variable map tiles and all this kind of stuff. It just makes it so replayable for a really good price. It's got beautiful Divinity to trade art. It's a great racing game. It's just, it's good on every single level. And it's just, it's a really good price. Yeah, it's really affordable and stuff. So it's great, good for the whole family. Yeah, That's it's awesome. The Quest for El Dorado at number seven. Number six has got a bit of campaign to it. And this it. is Sky Team. Absolutely. God, Sky Team's a great value. This is one that we've uh, been really in love with for the last uh, half year plus uh, since it came out. And we've been really enamored with the idea since we heard about it uh, yeah. well over a year ago. Uh, so Sky Team is a two player only uh, game that has some campaign elements to yeah. it, or you know, it's all scenario specific, but there's a lot to explore. We are playing as a pilot and co-pilot as you are approaching an uh, airport, your final destination, and you are going through all of the procedures that are required in order to land that plane safely. So you have to do things like, you gotta get your landing gear out. Got it's bad to land if you have no wheels. Truth. You gotta deploy those flaps, you gotta slow it down. You gotta clear other planes out of the way in front of you. You gotta be communicating with the radio. Uh, you gotta kind of manage your speed as you approach. Like how, how quickly are you approaching so you don't overshoot the airport. Yeah. There's all these conditions that are required to win. And it's a dice placement game where you're, you're gonna be rolling four dice on a turn. Mm -hmm. And the pilot and co-pilot each have a half of the board where they can place their dice. Yeah. And then there's kind of like a little throwaway spots where either player can play, where you can basically ditch a die to get a cup of coffee, which yeah, helps you. Get a little Java. It helps, helps you with, uh, yeah, you're rolling, uh, you know, mitigating dice rolls in the future. Um, and what's really fun and what I guess, you know, where the, a lot of the value comes in is that there's 
I don't know, eight, I, mean, nine, I think ten the base airports. game is great on its own. Yeah. But yeah, there's like 10 other airports you can fly into. And each of them gives you the same kind of gameplay and all the conditions to win, but it'll give you extra stuff. Like I think going into London Heathrow, there's extra planes that get added to yeah. your little... Because it's super busy. Your little board, because there's literally air traffic. And yeah. so you have more planes than you thought of and more ones that you weren't expecting to show up now show up mid-game that you have to then clear out of the yep. way. There's all sorts of stuff. There's, there's one where you have like an intern you have to take care of. There's one yeah. where you have like a kerosene leak. Yeah. And then going into different airports is different. There's like one where you're going through the airport in Nepal and you have to like come through like this. Yeah, you have to come in at certain tilts There's one stuff. where there's like ice on the tracks. So you have to like do there's And there's all these different ways. It has all these other components that you don't use in the base yeah. game. And then there's like, I think total, because there's a whole bunch of different airports, but even with all the other airports, there's like there's different multiple difficulties. multiple challenges within, yeah. So I think there's like over 20 different essentially scenarios that you can do. And yeah. every scenario you can do over and over and over again because they're still really interesting and fun. I played the base one because I've, I've shown this game to so many people. I almost always just play the base one and I have a great time every single time. Yeah. So even without that, because again, this game is like 35 bucks usually. It's like even just the base game I think would probably be worth it totally. And then you add all the other stuff they added into the game and you're just like... Man, this has got a ton of stuff. It's like a little campaign game. Yeah, the game grows with you as you get better at the game because yeah. the whole thing is about placing out dice and stuff and you can't talk mid-round back no, and of forth. Course. So you have to kind of read each other's minds a little bit and make sure you're you're you know on the same page. And as you get really good at that, there's more and more difficult yeah. challenges to explore. It's so good. It's yeah. just so good, so variable, just so cool, and a really, really gosh darn great value. So last time, we did this list like many, many years ago. One many we put on there, ago. and I stand by it, is Gloomhaven. So we're, we're going to talk about Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, because I don't think this was out when we reviewed yes, that list. Yes, it's an even better value. But Gloomhaven, Frosthaven, great all these games are great values. They cost a lot of money, but yet, you get so much out of it. You get 100 hours of playing out of it. That's a yeah, great value. That's a great <laughs> value, right? So we're not saying these games are all necessarily cheap. No. Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, which is sort of serves as an introduction into the world of Gloomhaven and stuff, and I think there's 25 scenarios. Something like that, yeah. It's like 25, um, I think. It's it over kind 20. of gets you going with four fully playable characters you can play with Gloomhaven and stuff yep. like that. Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion is super priced to sell. It's, you know, very available like in Targets and things like 40 that. 35, 40 bucks a lot of time on yeah. sale. Yeah. And you get like 25 scenarios, four characters to try a really truly fantastic tutorial system yeah where basically the first several scenarios it's the first like five games you're gonna yeah. have some training wheels on yeah and they're going to take you through uh kind of all the elements of the game in a really smartly planned out fashion so that it gives you just like little bites of like Here's this element. Here's how we attack. Here's yeah. how we play cards and stuff like that. And it's honestly so great at help helping teach a ultimately kind of big, complicated yeah. game. Uh, it really does a fantastic job. So if you're like, I want to dive into a campaign game. I really want to go into it. Something like a Gloomhaven is terrifying because it's so huge. Try something like this where it's a little bit more limited in scope, but gives you all of the kind of flavor, the ability to upgrade characters, and all those things that you enjoy from those larger campaign experiences in a just a more compact, yeah. easy to get through experience. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, again, I, I think Gloomhaven proper, Frost, I mean, Easily on the list. It was last time. I stand yeah. by that. You know, it's like I think they're. I think these kind of big campaign games. They do sometimes get a little wild, but like a lot of times, like these kinds of ones where it's just like it's just one game. It's like yeah, it's like 150 bucks, but like you're getting. If, if you, you invest, if you're playing if you it a couple times a week, it. you'll be playing for months. Yeah, it's just it's like it's amazing. insane. And then Jaws Line, it has that nice spiral bound notebook that has all the maps in it, so it's also just like it's less unwieldy than like a oh, Gloomhaven. That book is and one it's of the like, best things ever been made. I played through Gloomhaven Jaws Line with my roommate, and it was so much fun. The characters in it are super interesting, super good, and again. A lot of times at Target, it's like forty bucks on sale or less. I, mean, I think I think the retail retail price is like fifty bucks, which is super worth it. And then again, a lot of times online, you can find this for like thirty five bucks. It's just like it's such a good Call price. It two bucks per scenario. I'll pay that. <laughs> I'll pay that. That's yeah, fair. it's just so much fun. I love Gloomhaven. I always will. And Jaws Line, I think, is such a good rendition of it. And I, I really, I hope they eventually do uh, something else with it because I think it's I think a cool thing. But yeah, Gloomhaven Jaws Lion. All big campaign games are, in my opinion, usually worth it if you actually pay them. Now, if you're just buying all these campaign games and not playing them, but also maybe, I don't know how much money yeah, you make. Maybe you're a millionaire, right? You do what Who you cares? want with your money. But unless, Blue Bear Jaws Line, it's great. Number four falls into the trick-taking category, because let's be honest, people have been playing spades for generations. Yeah, so this is as close as we'll get to the whole, like, just buy a deck of cards yeah. thing. But this is the crew, yeah. specifically uh, Mission Deep Sea, yes. but honestly, both versions of the crew are great. This is a cooperative 
trick-taking game where you were going to be given uh, different missions, different uh, goals to yes. accomplish. I need which, to collect the red, the ye pink seven and the blue three. Right. And we'd lose if I don't get those. Yeah, and so when you're going through in trick-taking, if you're not familiar with the kind of concept of trick-taking, it's a, a game, you know, or I should say a whole category of <laughs> a whole games genre. where you are going to uh, have a leader of the trick who's going to play one card from their hand of like eight, nine, ten, you know, whatever amount of cards. Uh, and that's gonna have a number and a suit, a color in this case for uh, the crew. And when it comes around to you, if you have that color, that suit, you must follow suit. And if you don't, you can break away and throw off and, and throw yeah. off and and play other things. And that's the kind of trick taking gist. And there's a million trick taking games that all put little twists on that general yeah. concept. And so the crew gives you those specific objectives. Like Nick has to have win. Uh, you know, uh, the blue three, it's like, well, that's not a very high card. So like, how do I, as the owner of the blue three, yeah. throw off so I can make sure I lose the trick so that Nick is the one who wins and collects that card. Yes. And that is such a fun, so juicy thing to kind of like, you know, and if you have a, a scenario where you have three or four different objectives, like how do we make all of these things work at the same time? Because they might seem like it's kind of, they're competing against each yeah. other. And it's a really fun, difficult task. And the great thing about trick taking that uh, that we really love is that the way you play your cards, yeah. what card you play and when you're and why, talking, is a way to communicate what you have in your hand. Of course, I can't openly say what I have in my hand. That'd break the whole thing apart. But I can show you what I don't have. If you lead with green, I don't play green. Okay, we know Mike doesn't have this entire category of cards because if I had green, I would have had to play yeah. it. And so that kind of secondary communication that can happen through trick taking yeah. is so fun. And with the crew, we're extra incentivized to communicate because we're all on the same team. Yeah. Versus, you know, typically trick taking will be a competitive. Generally, uh, yeah. Thing. Or team based or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And it's just, and we, we specifically say the crew mission deep sea because there's a crew quest for planet nine. Yeah. And then crew mission deep sea. And the, they're fundamentally the same game for the most part. The difference is, is that. The crew mission deep sea scales based off your player count. Um, so there's better. basically certain missions that are easier if you're playing a three player game or much, much harder if you're playing like a five player game. And so basically each scenario you have like, you need to do like 10 level of difficulty. And so if you're playing a four player game, this specific task that you need to do might be like four difficulty. But if you're playing a three player game, it might only be like two. And so basically it just, it makes the different player counts work better. Whereas the, the crew, uh, Quest Planet at Nine. If you're playing a five-player game, it's really difficult, really, yeah. really difficult, um, and so it's just better. But ultimately, they're they're really, really great. Um, and again, they're like fifteen bucks. The crew you can play forever and ever 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 uh, because it's just so darn good and so it's super awesome. cheap. And so yeah, the crew is outstanding. It's a number four. Number three is a game I feel like we talk about all the time, just because we're so I'm, I can't I'm help constantly it impressed by this game. This is Paint the Roses. Mm. Paint the Roses, uh, there's like two versions, like the normal version, the deluxe version. The deluxe version is also a pretty darn good price because it's yeah. like 60 or 65 bucks. But the normal version that doesn't have like acrylic tiles is usually like mid-20s. It's, it's so super cheap. cheap. And this is a cooperative deduction game yeah. where you are gardeners for the Queen of Hearts set in the Alice of Wonderland uh, Alice in Wonderland world. So the Queen of Hearts has her garden. She wants her garden to look a very specific way. You cooperatively are the gardeners of the garden. And she has told all of you something about how she wants her garden to look. Yes. And it's gonna be, they're called whims. And on these whim cards, it'll tell you that I need a pink rose bush next to a rose bush that looks like a spade, like the suit of card spade. Yeah. And you're like, okay, I need to do that. And so basically what you're doing on your turn, and everyone has different whims. These are all things the queen has told us she wants. And basically on your turn, you're gonna take a tile. Each tile is gonna have a bush that again, looks like the suit of a card. And then it's also gonna have a different color of rose, yellow, red, pink, and purple. And you're gonna put it somewhere in the garden. And then you basically have to put your little cubes on there to show if that placement made a match for your thing. So or again, multiple matches, or multiple matches, because again, if I need like yellow roses next to pink roses, and there's a spot where there's like three pink roses, I put a yellow rose, I'll put three cubes because that makes three matches for me. And then also, but I might've made a match for Mike because he needed like clubs next to hearts right. or something like that. So then Mike be like, oh, that also makes a match for me. And then at the end of every round, once everyone puts out any and all matches, 
you have to guess on someone's whim. Yeah, at least one. You can't obviously guess on your own. Be like, I guess that I have pink and yellow. But <laughs> the team has to guess on somebody's whim. So we're like, you know what? Nick just put out three matches for that. There's three pink things. There's one yellow. I think Nick is pink and yellow. And then eventually you agree. I go, yay. And then I reveal you were correct, right? And then you'll basically move your gardeners up on this track. And also on the track is the queen with a big old ax. Yes. Because every round she's gonna be moving towards you and you're constantly trying to stay ahead of her by yeah. pa doing these whims. The more cards. whims you complete, the further around the board you go, the further away from the yeah. queen you are. But it gives you, you wrong, more of a chance. Yeah, if you get it wrong, Round ends immediately. The queen always moves on every turn, but they move double their speed yeah. if you are wrong, and the queen, as you go, speeds up. So they start off moving yeah. one space per turn. Then they start moving two, then three, then four, then five. And again, if you're wrong, it's double whatever that number is, and it's it, you gotta be pretty on it to stay yeah. alive. It's it's tough, and, and there's, there's easy whims, medium whims, and hard whims, and they'll have basically, like, easy whims will always be like color to color match. Yeah. But then hard could be like, Color to suit, suit to suit, color to color, all these different things. And the thing is, is you you can't just do easy whims. She no. will catch up to you yeah. and chop your head off. And you're limited to one player around the table can be working on an easy whim at a time. Yeah, but so honestly, you have to be going for higher stuff. It's just so good. And because it's that cooperative deduction, the whims are always gonna be different each time. It's just, it's wildly different every single time you play. You're doing that kind of deduction, communicating with each other as much as you can. And again, for the price it is, it's just insanely good value. It's so We've fun. introduced this to so many different people. There's so much to explore. Uh, yeah, you can get that base game, and then if you want, in the deluxe version, I think, comes all together, but there's basically all these modules you yeah. can play with. Um, we just always play the base game, though, because yeah. that's plenty enjoyable enough for us. So yeah, yeah that, and the regular version is super nice. Deluxe version is obviously super amazing. Um, yeah, it's great. But yeah, it's just really fun. So number two was our number one game of last year, and I wanted to make a number one for this list too. This is the White Castle. We could have. Uh, we it's, absolutely could. It's like thirty dollars online. It's it like thirty to thirty-five dollars. Is so affordable, and as you know, Ridiculous. if you've heard us talk about it yet, we love the size of the box, the size it takes up on the table. It's not super gigantic, but it gives you a ton of giant gameplay in a small, affordable box. I mean, it really is. <laughs> it's insane. You know, for when the. The average price of the games that we typically like, those mid to heavyweight euros, is around the $80, $90 range. Yeah. It's really sweet to have one that's at 30 bucks because <laughs> yeah. it just proves that like, hey, these can be cheaper and they're still really great. There's nothing with sacrifice as no. a result. This is a game where you are drafting dice on your turn. When you draft a die, you will place it out uh, and take one or more actions. And it's all about building up your resources and then kind of chaining together the three main actions which help you remove the players from your player board. There are courtiers, there are warriors and uh, gardeners. Uh, and they can go out onto the board and stuff. Everything's kind of worth points as they go out yeah. into the castle or out into the fields or wherever. Um, and you're trying to chain together uh, a lot of the actions that you get to take as a result of taking one of those, you know, placing a courtier, for example, will allow you to take like a warrior action. Now you can go and do that. And how does that chain together to build up resources for the next turn? So it's all about finding synergies, combos uh, between stuff. And we just love how much gameplay you can get and how kind of brain burny this game can be as you're trying to eke out every possible moment out of it. And it's, again, contains size, it doesn't take up all nope. of your table and more, and it contains price as well. Yeah. It's just, it, again, as we've said many times, this game is a flex. Yeah, uh, and, in every way. And, and I see it as a call out to publishers everywhere saying, hey, let's scale it down, <laughs> get the price down, and keep the gameplay yeah. And it's got like nice big dice. It's got these cool like, cardboard yeah. bridges. So it's not like a it basic cut game. Or no, anything. it's like it looks really nice. Yeah. It's got such good gameplay. You play it over and over and over again. So You're just nice. trying to extend those turns, trying to do as much as you possibly can. It's got a great solo mode. I mean, it's just so good in every possible way. And it's just, again, I think I think the base price of this is like $39.99. And again, if you're buying it, most places are going to have it on sale. If you're buying online, especially, it's just like, it's just insane how cheap it is, how small it is. It's just so, it's so well done. <laughs> That's why we keep talking about it, because one, the game is great, but then we're just so happy that a game is like small and contained, but still provides that amazing, like heavier experience. It's just so dang good, and it's pretty darn cheap. Yeah, it's fantastic. Ugh. Yeah, we are uh, such big fans of that one. Um, now I just wanna play it again. We do have one more to get to. We're gonna hit it right now. I want to play this game for infinity. 
well, infinity Nick, times. Thankfully you can, because oh. this is, we're gonna do a kind of a combo one. This is Turing machine, or you Slash. can do like search for Planet X, or search Slash. for Lost Species. Indeed. Uh, or whatever, now Turing machine, the main one that kind of made us think about this, is a pure just logic, logic deduction. deduction game where yeah. you're trying to find a three number code. Uh, and you don't know what the code is. It's gonna be three numbers. Each number will be between one and five, but there's gonna be basically a lot of rules that the code follows, and you will be asking questions of an analog computer yep. saying, hey, is the three in fact uh, or is the yellow in fact less than three? And you'll check it because your code has a two for the yellow spot, the second number. And if it gives a little check mark, it means yes, the yellow number, that second number is less than three. So I know it's not three, four or five yep. now. And you're doing, asking different questions to basically whittle down to when you only have one possible code. There will always be one code that is possible. And what's really fantastic is there is an app there's 20 scenarios in the game, but there's an app that provides literally algorithmically millions of puzzles you can do, including a daily, I call it the turtle, yeah. the Turing machine uh, challenge for the day yeah. where you have certain cards, the verifiers and stuff, the verifiers are the kind of rules and stuff. Uh, and you can play this game forever. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, there is no end to the amount of puzzles. Yeah. And that's the thing, like these kinds of logic deduction games, Search Planet X or Search Planet Species, which I've been playing a lot of recently, are similar where it's like, in this case, you're trying to find planet X or, or this lost species, but it's on a map board and there's all this kind of logic rules where especially the search for lost species, where it's like, you're trying to find this lost species, but there's all these other animals. There's like these laurel, laurels, laurels, lorries, they're birds. And the lorries are always in this kind of diamond shape, in always. Flock. So if you find one of them, you know the other three are somehow connected to it. Yeah. All the couscous, these little marmot looking things, they're always, there's three of them, they're all within one, zero, one or two of each other. So they're all gonna be nearby. You know a python is never next to a couscous. There's all these different logic rules that are always present in the game, but then the app in all these things just algorithmically chooses a place for the lost species to be and then fills out everything else and it has a seed and you can give you give that seed to other players so they have the exact same one. But again, because you have a map, because in, in um, Turing Machine you have five different numbers in, in three different colors, it's like they can just make millions of yeah, these. And you'll just, and every time it's different because of the fact that things are in different places. So every single time you have a new deduction puzzle of like, okay, well, if this, if the toad is here, then that means this thing can't be here because mm -hmm. this can't be next to this. And it's just, it's so well done. And all these games are like relatively small because so much of the work is done by like the app yeah, they and are the app deduction assistive. of you that they just, they're pretty well, pretty well contained and they just have so many options. Yeah, absolutely. The Search for Planet X and, and Search for Lost Species makes it a little more of a board game. So if yeah. you want something that has more board gamer vibes than, than like yeah, a Turing machine, pure deduction, which yeah. is pure deduction, that's a great way to go. And what's really cool is you have the rules for the game of like how the lorries work, how the couscous work, but then there's also game specific. Yes. Uh, extra rules yeah. and stuff that They're are like, like research clues that whatever, change yeah. from game to game. So you always have certain basic things about like the layout of the board, how things are going to relate to each other, but then the other things that change it up from game to game. So again, there's kind of infinity amount of times you yeah. can play. Uh, and that, that to us is just like, what's great is like by having a simple algorithm and I can go onto a browser and pull up today's Turing machine thing, I'll never do the same puzzle twice. No. Uh, it keeps you coming back and that just seems cool because we don't, you know, with that search for Planet X or whatever, it requires no new components. No, no. I don't have to buy any other physical thing because I have this device in my pocket which is already which here anyway. Do, right, yeah. Uh, that can provide infinite replayability yeah. and new challenges to explore. It's just so good. The, these kind of deduction games, uh, there's, I mean, Paint the Roses deduction game, deduction games are just, it's always a new puzzle, right? And that's so, mm -hmm. so interesting. They speak to us, as you can tell, we're fans of yeah. those. Yeah, so, <laughs> It's very, very good. So that is our list. Number one is Turing Machine slash a lot of other deduction games, but mostly <clears throat> Turing Machine is just like, man, it's so you good. can play forever. It's so good. Uh, that is our list. Down in the comments, there's so many other games. We actually have a whole other top 10, as we mentioned, over on our Patreon. 
and it was really tough whittling this list down. There's a lot of stuff on our other yeah. list that we were yeah. like, oh, I really want this one I don't one want to spoil here. anything, but I'm like, well, there's some good stuff over there. Yeah, so <laughs> and then down in the comments, let us know what are some games you think are a particularly good value. We didn't mention any rolling rights. Rolling rights are a great value. Absolutely. There's Literally so any many right. games out there, all board games really, um, are just such a good value. If you're talking about hours played to money spent, I've always said like board games, and I think video games too, are like, how many hours have I played Skyrim, right? Dude, it's just like Infinity Stardew hours. Valley, right? It's like hundreds of hours, you know? And it's just like they're board games, video games, games in general. Things play. Play is such a good value. Absolutely. It always is. It's so is. good for the heart. It's so good for everything. Um, and so, yeah, let us know what some really great value games. Give in the comments. Indeed. You've seen our patrons scroll by here. So if you want your name coming up in these top tens, again, check out our Patreon. Um, yeah. And I think that's it, yeah? That's it, everybody. We'll catch you on the next top ten. Bye, everybody.